Oh, so good. So good. Hey, welcome to Happy Hour at Vantage Point Church where we have been talking. Yeah, you guys can have a seat. I mean, I didn't tell you to sit down, but you absolutely can. No, we've been talking about the joy and the gratitude and the, just the happiness that should fill our hearts and our souls as we are expressing our gratitude to God for what he's done for us, as we are expressing our celebration for what God is and who he is in our lives, and as we worship him the way that he deserves and desires to be worshiped. And I hope that that's what's going to happen in here today. I'd love to go to him in a word of prayer, ask him to be here with us. Father God, we love you so much, and we are so, so thankful for what you have done in our lives. And Father, that we have a chance to be here in your presence and to worship you and to bring you the honor and glory that you so richly deserve. I pray that we would do that in an even better way today than we ever have. And I pray all this in your great and awesome name. Amen. Amen. Well, I have really, really loved this ser series so far as we've been talking about worship. Pastor Mark has really laid it out well, what worship is and why we should worship. And so I'm really excited about today, especially because it's a topic that's near and dear to my heart, honestly, because uh, maybe you know this about me, maybe you don't know this about me, but my early career in, um, in the church world was actually as a worship leader. In fact, I was the first worship pastor at Vantage Point Church when when this whole thing started. That's what I did. I led worship for many years here. In fact, I led worship even before that. I started leading worship about 35 years ago, if you can believe that. When I started leading worship, things were a lot different. I mean, the songs were different. The style of worship was different. Uh, we didn't have fancy things like we didn't have LED walls, you know, behind us. In fact, we had something called an overhead projector. <laughs> Does anybody remember the overhead projector? It is a technological wonder. And we would have one on one side of the stage and one on the other. And there'd be people sitting there with their transparencies. You remember those? And, and they would sit there and they'd slide it on there so that we could see the words. And sometimes it'd be like backwards and upside down. And they'd have to take it off real quick and put it up. It was amazing, honestly, the overhead projector. We didn't have moving lights. I mean, I do remember one time a light fell down and almost killed one of us on stage. I guess that was a moving light. But, you know, we didn't have maybe some of the technology and stuff like that. I I myself, as a worship leader, I had about as much um, talent as the worship leaders that we currently have now have in like their little fingers. And so it is really, really, really good for you as a church that I am no longer the worship leader at Vantage Point Church and other younger, more talented people who, by the way, um, they are some of the best people in this church. They are some of the most humble. That's not always the way it is with worship teams, but this team is just one of the most humble group of people, and they love God, and they love worship. And so we are so blessed to have all of our worship leaders here, and I'm so grateful for them. And as a matter of fact, I... Um, Oh, every once in a while, they will kind of, you know, they'll call me up and they'll beg me to come back and play with them. Okay, I actually beg them if I can come up and play, but somebody begs somebody. It's semantics at this point. But um, I was actually scheduled to be on stage um, one of my maybe four times during the year. And um, it, on June 2nd, today, June 2nd, today is my anniversary, my 34th anniversary. Woo! Yes, thank you. Um, Tracy, wherever you are, I love you. Thank you for 34 of the most amazing years. I am a, such a blessed man as I stand up here today. So um, it's super awesome that I get to be here with you on my anniversary. And um, I was scheduled to lead worship. And then um, Pastor Mark asked me late last week, hey, would you be able to, to preach on Sunday? And so <clears throat> rather than kind of cancel that and just do this, I thought, you know what? We're talking about worship I'm a worship leader. I'll just play and then I'll just come up and preach. And then later after service, I'll go out and park people in the parking lot. <laughs> I'll be like a full service gas station attendant today. Um, but no, I'm really excited to do it. Why? Because not only do I love worship and not only do I love talking about it, but the reason I'm really, uh, really excited to talk about today is because this is something that I have struggled with in my life. This is something that I have really struggled with. I have really grown in this area in my life a lot, but it is still something that I wrestle with even today. And I have a feeling as I look out over this room that many of you do too. 
especially maybe many of you men. And so I hope that today as we look at God's word, what he says about worship, and and maybe you can listen to my story, um, how God has worked in my life. Maybe, just maybe, we might begin to take baby steps toward this journey of becoming the type of worshiper that God desires. Last week, Pastor Mark really laid out what worship is um, in an amazing way. And uh, he talked about Jesus having this conversation with a woman, the Samaritan woman at the well. You guys remember that? Uh, John chapter 4, it's one of the great stories in the Bible. And Jesus makes this very profound statement about worship and about worshipers. If you remember, he says, a time is coming and is now come when true worshipers, remember that word, true worshipers will worship the Father in what? In spirit and in truth. For they are the kind of worshipers the Father seeks. God is, is spirit and his worshipers must worship God in spirit and in truth. Jesus says that if we are to be the type of worshipers that God is seeking, that we must worship God in two things, in spirit and in truth. And these are the types of worshipers that God is seeking. So what does it mean to be a, spirit, a, a worshiper in spirit and in truth? That's what we need to know, right? Because we want to be the type of worshipers that God is seeking. Well, first of all, let's talk about spirit. What does Jesus mean when he says you're going to worship God? True worshipers will worship God in spirit. Well, first of all, very basically, it means that true worshipers have the Holy Spirit living inside of them. The Bible says that when we give our lives to Christ and we become changed and we become followers of his and children of his, that the Holy Spirit comes into our lives and he lives inside of us and that anything good that comes out of us is directly a result of him working in our lives. And so if we're going to worship God, we must have the Holy Spirit in us and our worship must be driven by the Spirit. But he's also talking about something else, something besides the Holy Spirit. And that something else is this, that when we worship God in spirit, that our worship of him must come from within us. It must emanate from, it must be motivated by our love for our God. It must be motivated by our gratitude for our God, for what he has done in our lives. It must be sincere. It cannot be dead. It cannot be just mechanical. That it must come out of hearts that are just so grateful for what he's done that we have to express our feelings. It's supposed to be a feeling, an emotional thing when we worship our God in spirit. That's what Jesus says to us that we must worship him in spirit. And you know what he also, uh, what what we find in the Bible is that um, when we are worshiping God in the proper way, that people who are around us who don't know God, the Bible says that people who are around us who don't know God should see our worship of him and they should be so moved by our worship of him that they would glorify God. That's what he says. Now, so there's obviously this thing of us worshiping God in a way that people around us can understand that we are really worshiping someone awesome who has really changed our life. That's worshiping God in spirit. What does worshiping God in truth mean? Worshiping God in truth means this. This book right here, I don't know if you know this, this book right here contains everything we need to know about who God is for us to have a relationship with God. Did you know that? There's nothing that's not in here that you need to know about God. There's nothing that we can add or subtract from this. This book tells us exactly who God is. As he's revealed himself to us, we must worship that God. If we aren't worshiping that God as he's revealed himself to us in this book, we are not truly worshiping. Also, he tells us exactly how we are to worship him exactly how we are to interact with him, exactly how we can please him. And we cannot come up with our own rules. We can't just say, well, I do this because it feels good, or I do this because I think I should. We have to look at his word, and we have to see what he says, and what he says about himself, and what he says we should do in response to him are the things that we must do. If we are doing that, we are worshiping God in truth. If we are not doing that, we are doing something else. We're not worshiping God in truth. 
there are many people in this world who think they're worshiping God, who fly airplanes into buildings in the name of that God to do some act of worship to him, but because it's not the God of the Bible and it's not what God wants them to do, that is not worship. The children of Israel, if you know anything in the Old Testament, they would constantly, God would tell them, this is how I want you to worship me. And then they would go off and they would do other things and worship him in other ways. And God was never pleased with that. And it never ended up being a good thing for them because God has revealed himself to us and he's revealed himself, he's revealed how he wants us to worship him. And that's what it means to worship God in truth. Do you understand that? Spirit and truth with our hearts, with our heads, with our emotions, heartfelt, Worship lifted up to him, grounded exactly how he is, who he says he is. Both must be present if we are to be true worshipers of God, the kind of worshipers that Jesus said his father is seeking. Now, I think that most of us, the problem is most of us get at least one of these things wrong. Some of us are really good at the spirit worship and we're not that good at the truth to be honest and some of us are really good in the truth and we're not that good in the spirit but the problem is Jesus says both must be present in order for it to be true worship the kind of worship that God is seeking so some of you you know in this room I know some of you you're like you are spirit filled worshipers man you come to church and you are like immediately you're you're like high-fiving people and you're picking people up and you're saying I love you man and you're and you just you just emanate such joy to be here you walk into this room and boom your hands are raised and you are crying and you are singing and the service hasn't even started yet. It's just the countdown on the screen. And you are ready to go, man. But if I were to ask you, like, hey, I love the way you worship. Hey, could you tell me, like, where in the Bible you, you find how you worship described in the Bible? You'd be like, I don't know. You know, I just, I, I just do what feels good, what feels natural, what, what I see other people doing. I don't really know if that's how I'm supposed to do it. I just kind of do it. You're, you're good at the spirit worship. Maybe you're not so good at the truth of knowing God's word and knowing all about God. Some of you, on the other hand, you're, you're great, man. You know this book inside and out. In fact, you bring your Bible because you'd never be caught dead looking at your Bible on your phone because that's not a real Bible, you know. And uh, you know this book. You've memorized a bunch of it. You teach it, you know. You've been a small group leader and a small group coach. Man, you know this book, okay? And you come on Sunday and you're like, I'm not here for the fluff, all right? I'm here to hear the word and I'm here to get smarter and I'm here to know more about God. So like the high fiver comes up to you and you're, and you're like, get away from me, you know? And then, and then your wife, who is a little more spirit-led than you are, got, you know, and she's like, come on, we got to get in for the music. It's about to start. And you're like, uh, I got to go to the bathroom. And then you go to the bathroom and then you're like, I got to get a cup of coffee. And you're just hoping that the music will all go away before you have to come in. So you don't really have to interact with it that much, you know? Because then you, when you do find yourself here, it's just kind of a boring or uncomfortable time. You kind of stand with your hand in your pockets and you're just kind of waiting for it all to go away so you can get to the meat of what you came here for. You don't really express feelings or emotions. And to be honest, you kind of look at other people and you who are doing that, and you just kind of think, <laughs> interesting. I want to be really honest with you. I was that type of a Christian, of a worshiper. When I grew up, I grew up in a Christian home. I grew up in church. We used to go to church like five times a week. Um, uh, I, I knew the Bible. I read the Bible. I memorized a lot of the Bible. I loved the Lord. Um, I really wanted to know about why I believe what I believe. So I studied and I read books and I could tell you why I believe what I believe. I could give defense of my hope that I have in, in Jesus. I could debate with the best of them if they want to talk about is God real and all those things. Like I'm telling you that not, not to say that I'm a smart because I'm not, but just to tell you that I really, really love God's word and I have from a young age. But I remember being in a youth group and we were singing a worship song and I was just kind of, we were kind of sitting down and, and uh, they were singing and I was just kind of like, eh, you know, I just really didn't like that part of what we were doing. 
And I looked over and I saw a girl who was standing. I knew who she was and she was standing up. Nobody asked her to stand up. Nobody else was standing up. She just stood up and she was singing with her hands raised and I could see there were tears coming down and she had this smile on her face. And can I tell you what I was thinking when I was looking at her? I was judging her. I was like, why does she have to be like that? Later on, I remember, um, I remember having a conversation with her where we talked about the way she expressed herself in worship. She said she came from a more charismatic, you know, church where they expressed themselves more. And I was like, oh, okay, yeah, I get it, I get it. I said, but you know, I told her, I said, it's the truth that matters. It's not really emotions. You can't control your emotions. You can't trust emotions. And so emotions really don't have that big of a part in it. As a matter of fact, you could be distracting other people by expressing your emotions like that. And it could be distracting to other people. So you should just kind of control it. Just kind of, you know, keep it to yourself. That's what I told her. I sound like a really nice guy in high school, huh? Man, what a punk. <laughs> if I could go back, you know, f almost 40 years later, you know what I'd say to her? I'd say, forgive me for my ignorant, arrogant, hurtful words. You know what I'd tell that young punk if I could talk to him? I'd say, hey, Tom, you know, you think you know a lot. You don't know that much, honestly. <laughs> you think you know a lot and you do love God's word and you do love God. You have that going for you. But here's the thing. When you say you love God's word, there's a few parts of God's word that you just kind of skim by and you just kind of try to ignore because they don't quite fit into your take on things. And, and I know that you love truth and it's true that truth without, I mean, worship without truth isn't worship at all. But shouldn't the truth that you say you believe about God, shouldn't it change you and shouldn't it move you in a way that actually you feel and you express something if it were real in your life, wouldn't it actually move you in some way to, to have some emotion and some feeling if you claim that this God who you love, who's given you everything, and it doesn't even move your emotions a bit, something's wrong with that. It's like, I remember... Um, Tracy and I, we got this gift for somebody for Christmas, and we were so excited about it. This isn't one of my family members. <laughs> we were so excited about it because we knew that they would love this gift so much, and we had researched, and we had found it, and it was hard to find, and we paid a lot of money for it, and we wrapped it up, and we brought it, and we were like, man, this is going to be so great to see their face when they open this thing, because they want this thing, and it's going to really make a big difference, and so we gave it to them, and they unwrapped it, and you know what they said? They said, oh, that's, that's nice. Thank you, and they kind of put it off to the side, and we started talking about something else. I was like, Oh, no, you didn't. I was like, how? I'm thinking in my mind, how dare you with what I have sacrificed to give this thing that you would just be like, thank you, set it aside and not be just gushing with emotion about it. And I wonder how often God feels that way about me. How often God feels that way about you. As we worship him and we don't even express any emotion anything that comes from our hearts to him in response to what he has done I wonder if he feels that way sometimes as well John Piper is a pastor and a theologian I love this quote he has. It's so right on, I think. He says, truth without emotion produces dead orthodoxy and a church full of artificial admirers. On the other hand, emotion without truth produces empty frenzy and cultivates shallow people who refuse the discipline of rigorous thought. But true worship, remember Jesus talked about true worship. John Piper expounds on that. He says, true worship comes from people who are deeply emotional 
and who love deep and sound doctrine. Strong affections for God rooted in truth are the bone and marrow of biblical worship. Is it, is it possible that what Jesus was saying is we should love doctrine deeply, but we should also have deep emotions in response to it? Yes, there are all kinds of different personalities in this church, and God has made each one of us to fit perfectly with each other. And some of you are very expressive and very emotional, and some of you are more like me. You're not expressive, and you're, you tend to not be as emotional of a person, and it's okay. Not one isn't right and one is wrong. God made all of us this way to, to bring us together so that we would have this beautiful thing called the body of Christ. Pastor Mark and myself are very different people. Pastor Mark is much more energetic, much more emotional, much higher than I am. He can also be much lower than I am. I'm kind of just, you know, steady Eddie down the middle of it. And his way is not better. And my way is not better. We complement each other. If, if, if all of us on staff and in this church leaders were like me, this would be the most boring church in the history of the world. None of you would want to come to it. On the other hand, if we were all like Pastor Mark, the church would have fallen apart years ago because, you know, it's, it's like, and, and I'm there and we help each other and we need each other and his way is not better and my way is not better it's just that some of us are more naturally inclined to be expressive and some of you aren't and when we're talking about our worship of God those of us who are like me who aren't inclined to be worshipers of God need sometimes a little bit of help to get us there because it's not what comes out of us naturally but it's not okay for us to use that as an excuse. You know what I'm saying? It's not okay because God wants our heartfelt expressions. And, and I think in, this wor- in, in his word, he gives us some really good instructions on how to do that. A lot of, uh, especially you go through the Psalms, man. It's like constantly, most of it written by David, this warrior, this man's man. And yet he is not afraid to get down and dirty with his feelings and his expressions of worship to God. And so I need, you need to read those things and to understand this is what God, not only it says it's okay, hey, this is what God wants from us and desires from us. And if we aren't willing to do it because of our personalities or our upbringing or our pride or whatever it is, then we are not only missing out on a lot of what God has for us, but we're also not worshiping God truly the way he desires to be worshiped. And so it's something that we need to deal with. And so, you know, did you know the Bible talks about, you know, nine or 10 different ways that we can worship God? Um, Stuff like, you know, Psalm 100 says, shout for for joy to the Lord all the earth. Have you ever shouted for joy to the Lord? Sing, come before him with joyful songs. Know the Lord is God as he who has made us. Enter his gates with thanksgiving and his courts with praise. Give thanks to him. Praise his name. Does that sound like what you do when you come into God's presence, into his house? And of course, I'm not saying this is all worship, right? Worship is everything. We've talked about that last week. It's everything, every part of our lives. But what happens in here is also very important for us because what happens in here is can be a catalyst to strengthen us and build us up, to spring us outside of these walls so that we then are able to worship God with all of our hearts in every facet of our life. What happens in here is important to God and it should be important to us. God talks a lot about how he wants us to sing to him. Psalm 47, 6, sing praises to God, sing praises to our king, sing praises. Psalm 104, I will sing to the Lord as long as I live. I will praise my God with my last breath. I will praise my God if I were dying and I had one last breath. You know what it would be, David said? It would be to sing a praise out to my God. Wow. Wow. Bowing down. We don't do that a lot. But have you ever bowed down in worship to God? Did you know when you, there's something about a posture of your, of your body, which is I think why God does this. If you bow down, it's hard to be humble. Even now, I feel foolish. To bow down before God, it does something to your heart. And God knows this. And that's why he says, come, let us worship and bow down. Let us kneel before the Lord, our God, our maker. Standing, to stand in the presence of God. Psalm 119, 120. 
We stand at weddings, right? When the bride starts coming down, we all stand. Why? To honor the bride and the groom. Do we stand in honor of the one who made us? Clapping, dancing. We used to sing a song called, I Could Sing of Your Love Forever. Anybody remember that song if you're old like me? I could sing of your love forever. Remember that? <clears throat> Funniest thing, man, because we'd be singing that song and I'd be like trying to exhort people, you know, like trying to get, you know, I'm, I'm looking at like the guy who's the, the most, you know, not going to do it. And I'm just trying to really pull it out of him, you know, and uh, because I know him because I am him. <laughs> and he'd be like this and we'd sing the bridge and the bridge is like this. It, it goes like this. And this is exactly what, what he'd be looking like. Oh, I feel like dancing. It's foolishness, I know. Because when the world has seen the light, they will dance with joy like we're dancing now. <laughs> That's so funny. <laughs> if the world would see that, they don't want any part of this. Then no wonder they want to go to happy hour at the bar and not happy hour at the church if that's what they see when they see us worshiping our God. Are you kidding me? Clapping, lifting hands. This is, this is a big one for people in church like, oh, lifting hands, man. That's the, the holy rollers. They do that. I don't do that. <laughs> Lamentations 3.41, let us lift our hearts and our hands to God in heaven. Let my prayer be counted as incense before you and the lifting up of my hands as the evening sacrifice. Now listen, none of these expressions are foreign to us. We do these things all the time. It's just that we don't do them here in church maybe in response to and worship to our God for some of us, right? I used to be a Dodger fan. Now I'm an Angel fan. I know my timing sucks. I know, I know. I hope Otani blows his elbow out again. I really, no, I'm just kidding. I don't, I don't, I don't, I don't, I don't. I don't. But I remember when the Dodgers won their last real world series in 1988. Um, and, and Kirk Gibson, you remember that? Oh man, it was incredible, right? Kirk Gibson, he can't even walk and he's like, and he, and he swings and the ball goes. Now I was sitting on my parents' couch and I got up, I stood up and I was like, no. No. And I started like jumping up and down. I started like, oh my gosh. Oh my gosh. I started yelling, go, get out, get out. My hands were raised. I was like, yes. As the, as the, as the ball cleared the fence, I was like clapping. I was singing. I was jumping. I literally fell on my knees. I'm like, Kirk Gibson, what you did for me. It literally in 30 seconds, I did every single one of these expressions. I remember standing not long after that, standing in a church where we were worshiping and, and I was really wrestling with this idea. And it's like, it's like God just kind of went in and to, my, to, to me and he like poked me. My stomach started churning like I wasn't enjoying this because he was like, Tom, I, I want you to do something for me. I want you to lift up your hands. I'm like, I've never lifted my hands I can't do that. That's not me. It's like, I, I really almost thought he said, well, that's not quite true. I saw what you did with Kirk Gibson's home run. <laughs> Why wouldn't you do that for me? That's a low blow, God. And so I stand in there. It's so hard for a person like me. And we were singing. I don't remember the song. I was just like, okay, I'll do it. I, I don't want to because they're gonna, people are going to look at me funny. Uh, it's scary. Uh, it was really my pride, to be honest with you. But I just said, okay, God, I want to do it. And I lifted up my hands. Now, I'd like to say I lifted them up like touchdown, <laughs> but I didn't. I didn't even do YMCA. I didn't even do Mufasa. <laughs> you might describe it maybe more like, I don't know, carry the TV. <laughs> I don't know. It wasn't even a 70 inch. It was right down here in the 40, 42 inch TV, man. 
But I lifted my hands. I'd like to say that everything changed. I'd like to say that that moment totally destroyed my pride and totally turned me into this worshiper of God in spirit and in truth. But you know what? It was like 30 seconds of my hands being raised that felt like an eternity, but I could feel what God was doing. He was breaking me down from a person who would never express his emotion. He didn't even like to express his emotion to his wife, but who would not express his emotion in church to God. That's, that's just like, that wasn't the way I was raised and it wasn't the way I felt I was made. And he was just like, what would you do for me? What are you holding back from me? I'm like, God, you don't want me to be something I'm not, do you? And he's like, of course I do. The whole Bible is me telling you, you're not what you should be. I want you to be something else, something better, something better for you. And so that day was just a, a baby step in a journey of a thousand baby steps for me. And as God has changed me. And as I have allowed him to, I really have grown to love different expressions of worship and to love the freedom that comes from a guy like me who so doesn't want to seem like a fool and so wants to keep himself, you know, just all buttoned up. Doesn't want to express himself to express himself. To the point where now it's like I, I get up here on stage and I'm talking about what Jesus did for me. I have to think of something else or I get that ugly, weird cry face. And it's embarrassing and I don't want to do it. But I have learned God has changed my heart. Somebody said, it's your 10 grandkids that have made you such a softie. That might be true too. But I really do know that God has done a work in me. And so... I just want to give you permission because I see a lot of you out here. I know you. You're looking at me right now and you're like, I hate the fact that I came today. I hate the fact that you're preaching today. Why don't you just leave me alone? I'm just telling you, I am you. I've experienced exactly what you've had. I've felt all those same things. And I know what it's like to experience the freedom of just letting God, baby step by baby step, have his way with you. That's what I want for you too. So what we're going to do is we're going to sing one last song. Um, I'm in an awkward place because I'm the keyboard player <laughs> who usually comes out behind the pastor. So I'm going to go back. <laughs> I'm, I'm going to come back. All right. So, so let me just give you a little, little like behind the scenes. This is the way it usually works. Um, if I'm playing keyboard like this, I get a text saying, stand by, stand by. Pastor Mark is getting to that point. Stand by. So I'd come over here and I'd stand by and then I'd get the text. Go, go, go. And it's important that I get out in time and I have to plug in and then I have to put my ears in which is kind of hard with this. Where's my ears? Oh, I tucked them down here so it wouldn't look funny when I was preaching. So I pull my ears out and I put them in. And I got to start playing soon when Pastor Mark's at his right place because there's just something that happens when the piano comes in behind somebody who's preaching, right? I mean, this sounds fine. But now the Holy Spirit is moving behind me. So I got to make sure I'm in the right key. I am. Okay, good. We're good. So I'm ready to help lead a song for you guys to worship to. Are you guys ready? Maybe today what you could do is you could just take a baby step. 
I'm not asking you to just jump in with both feet, both hands raised, fall on your knees. That would be like jumping into the deep end of a pool when you don't know how to swim. I'm not asking you to do that. What I'm just saying is that maybe today you could take a baby step. It could be such a small step that nobody around you would even know you were taking it, but you would know and God would know. And maybe your baby step is just, hey, you never sing because you don't like to sing. You feel embarrassed to sing. It seems weird to be in church singing with people. And so you literally just stand there as the rest of us sing. Maybe today your baby step is, you know what? You would just sing. You would just lift up your voice to God. You wouldn't get all crazy, but you would just sing the song that we're singing. Maybe today your baby step would be that you would sing with your heart, that you would let your emotions come out, that you wouldn't suppress what you're feeling. You would let the words ring true in your heart. If you believe them and you would say, God, I'm just gonna, I'm just gonna let my heart sing out to you. Maybe today you're you would just say, my baby step is that I'm going to lift my hands for the very first time. You might not do touchdown. You might just do carry a really little TV in one hand. I don't know. But you would do something. You would just say, God, I don't want to lift my hands to you because of my pride. But I will do it because I know you are worthy of that and so, so much more. I'm going to ask the band to come out and join me on stage. We're going to sing one more song. Maybe to you, today your baby step is something else. I don't know. Maybe you get down on your knees. I don't know what it is. I don't need to know what it is because you're not doing it for me and you're not doing it for the people who are next to you. This is going to be you saying, God, I want to take one baby step into becoming the worshiper that you want me to be. And I know I won't be completely there today, but I want to be one baby step closer to it than I was before I walked into this room. Whatever it's going to be, you might feel like it costs you something. It costs you your pride. It costs you some amount of effort today. That's okay. You know why? Because how does, how does David describe it when we worship God? He describes it like this. He says, we bring a sacrifice of praise. What does a sacrifice mean if it doesn't mean it costs you something. And so today, you figure out what it is that it's going to cost you. And you give that to God right now because He is worthy of it. He is completely and utterly worthy of what we're going to do right now and so much more, people. But God wants to have something from you right now. And so let's Let's worship him right now. Let's lift it up to him together. Come on. Let's give it to him now. You 